object lessons are fun. Except when you're the object of the lesson. <laughs> or you're the lesson object that God uses in order to minister to someone else. The uh, challenges we face every day in life sometimes aren't well discussed in the Christian world or brought out in our evangelical Christian life because a lot of times people don't want to hear about it. You know, they don't want to deal with it up front and in your face kind of thing because it's not always the best topic to bring up, but you know, suffering happens. You know, the kind of stuff that you don't want to hear about, like a loved one dying or suddenly you discover you've got cancer or you've got an incurable disease and you're going to suffer the rest of your life or that you've got Alzheimer's which is the popular one right now to panic over or that you've got HIV or some other disease that really just crashes your world in on you most of the time most people just want to heal you and get rid of you in other words Let's pray for him for healing and then bye-bye. You're on your way. Or, you know, we want to hear about those stories of the valiant person lying in the hospital bed, oh, looking like a saint and an angel and blessing those that come. And then the doctor walks in and says, we found nothing. And everybody goes home rejoicing. We love those stories. We don't like the other side of the story. You know, the ones that aren't laying in bed rejoicing, the ones that are struggling and dying miserably and horribly, the ones that are agonizing up until their last breath and then finally they're released to the Lord because they are a Christian even though they may have suffered greatly and they may have agonized before they die. Sometimes suffering is allowed by God in order for us to learn graces and sometimes God allows suffering in some of us to teach others around us how to learn mercy or compassion because God doesn't cause suffering God allows suffering to happen in the lives of the saints because even with Job God allowed for Satan to come and to do to Job what he would but it was for a lesson to be learned and a demonstration not just to Job and his friends but a demonstration to those that were in heaven, as well as eventually for us who read the story of Job. And Job suffered miserably, unbelievably. You know, people often tell me, well, Job's just a great story to give someone in suffering. And I look at them like they're insane. So are you kidding me? I spent 10 years of my life, you know, in the hospital, suffering miserably at times, in and out usually for the minimum of three months the maximum that I spent in the hospital was eight months maybe nine and believe me when I was in the hospital the last thing I want to read is Job <laughs> there ain't no comfort to a comfort to a suffering person you know found in Job the comfort you find is mainly in Jesus really because Jesus had compassion constantly on those who were suffering everywhere he went anywhere he was at whenever he saw the faith or saw the person reaching out that was really desperate that was broken and of a contrite spirit he stopped what he was doing and he looked and he had compassion upon them kind of like the good Samaritan you know who was passing by you know and he saw that panhandler on the street, you know, and he went over and helped him. Oh, it wasn't a panhandler? Okay. You tell your story with your way, I'll tell it mine. <laughs> because you see, some of the panhandlers aren't just panhandling to make a fortune. Some of them are indeed. Or the homeless people that, yes, they might want to be homeless. But they might have needs still too. Because I haven't yet heard of a ministry that wanted to be the church of the homeless and have no walls you know to just travel around with the homeless people you know and be their pastor or their minister 
kind of like the children of Israel that wandered in the wilderness. Though God had told them they could enter into the promised land, they didn't inherit the promise. They were cast out of the promised land and denied going in until that generation had passed away because they didn't accept the way God wanted to do it, which was by faith. They wanted to look at the trials and tribulations to say, this can't be God. We had it better off in Egypt than they murmured and grumbled and whined and griped. Kind of like people do today in America, you know, about the president, about how things aren't quite so good for us, how we're having such unemployment rate, how things are tough, really, compared to the rest of the world. So, I spent a great majority of my life learning suffering that I might have compassion on others and tenderness towards those. Because if you go through suffering, when you lose a loved one, first of all, if you lose a loved one, you don't immediately get compassion. You get, really, misery. You feel miserable. You feel depressed. You hit that bottom of the well, that darkness. And you don't know where to turn because nobody seems to have an answer for you. You know, you try to put on praise music, you try to do this, that, and that immediately fades away because you're not acknowledging the fact that there's loss in your life. Now for me, yeah, you know, loved ones is like, hey, you know, I was thankful they went to a better place than I was that they remained in hell with me. But, you know, I understand the pain and suffering part of it. I just don't know the loss of loved ones part. And I was like, yeah, I miss them for a little while. You know, went through it, but I already knew I was going to come through it. But I guess that was because I trained myself to be ready for that time of losing someone that I cared about. You see, I took a class back in maybe 77, I think, when I was going through one of my phases of health because I was pretty much dying most of the time. It might have been 80, I'm not sure. And I went to Modesto JC and took a course on death and dying. And it helped people that were dying to work through their dying process. It helped people that were going to become counselors to go into hospitals to get have a mental health counselor certificate. It helped basically everyone, no matter where you were coming from, whatever religion you were in, whatever faith you had, whatever denomination or whatever uh, scientific background or anything. Everyone was all together in these classes. And we went through the five stages of dying, you know, and lost by the Cougar Ross studies. And it was new at that time, you know. Now it's kind of like old school. But I remember going through it and all the different people and uh, the different way that they related things, you know. And I was doing my own journal on dying and, you know, it was a fascinating study. I called it Exposition of a Human Being. And uh, God showed me a lot about Christian world, worldly world, and how we don't understand the reality of the spiritual world that we're going to inhabit. Because if we knew really, that it's so much better where we're going, then we wouldn't be so upset about where we've been, and we would enjoy the fact that someone was leaving. You know, I always think of those funerals that were down at um, New Orleans, you know, when you'd see that, oh, when, you know, they would take this casket marching like a dirge, you know, all the way to the grave, and then all of a sudden they'd start singing this song, you know, and then they'd go, oh, when the saints go marching, and they'd start rejoicing, you know, that the person was dying, and they'd be singing these songs, and I thought, yeah, that's what Christians do, you know, and then later on I found out that's really not what Christians do, you know, some of them, when I was in the Jesus movement, you know, they'd put these little balloons together and tie these little notes, you know, let them go in the sky, which was kind of like back to a Japanese tradition that they do over in Japan, you know, and do in Korea and other countries in the world. Which I thought was, well, you know, heating balloon. I kind of looked at it and watched the balloon, and I thought, it'll pop it from now. So I wasn't really, you know, I was always too practical for my own good. I wasn't really much into that idea. But the whole idea about rejoicing, you know, in a funeral, per, per, funeral per se, funeral, funeral, well, parade, funeral parade. Now, when I saw the first time that I ever went to a military funeral, I thought that was very honorable. You know, I kind of felt 
interesting there. And that was kind of different, you know. And then when I watched Schindler's List one time, you know, and putting the rocks on, you know, funeral. And when I went over to Israel, I saw the same thing. That kind of touched me, you know. That was kind of interesting, too. Because building a heap or building a memorial, although it's really to keep the animals out, because that's where the tradition came from. But building a heap of stones, you know, as though it were an altar, that kind of inspired me, you know. And I think that's what God wants to do when you're suffering. He wants to not necessarily comfort you directly, because He is the God of all comfort, but you're going to suffer. Because if it's a time of suffering for you, you will suffer. You will be in pain. You will hurt. You will be depressed. Your flesh will agonize. But your soul, you have the choice of which way it goes. It'll mainly be kind of pulled towards your flesh, which kind of wants you to kind of be dragged down. But there is also inside you still a spirit that, depending upon how old you are in the Lord and how much you know God, you're going to kind of, part of you is going to be able to kind of endure it. You know, kind of like, wow, oh, you know, I feel it here, but there's something about this almost like invisible wall that I've compartmentalized you know, myself away from this pain that I'm feeling. It's almost as though there's a slight wall of separation between the holy and profane, like it says in Ezekiel 42.20. Um, kind of like you know somebody's hand holding back the majority of the pain. Most of the effects of your chemo or your nausea. But not all. Because you see, you still live in a body of flesh. You still will suffer. You still will die. And that's what being prepared for that I like about my early childhood was that I was trained up in being prepared for death. For me, man, I was already. I was like, hey, I'm ready to check out anyway. I was like, hey, let's go. Just drag my body and toss it in the dumpster and I'm happy because I'll be gone. <laughs> but I recognized later that people really don't prepare for death. They prepare for life. And so I think that maybe we need to reevaluate sometimes the Son of Man when he came here. You know, he came as one acquainted with sorrow, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He knew how to cry. You know, I know there's a recent movie that came out that, you know, it seemed like most of the comments were that people were all excited because it showed men crying. And I thought, I'm doing that all my life, but okay. You know, and it was like, it's okay for good men. It's, men can cry. It's okay. Well, yeah, Jesus did. I mean, hey, you know, sorry, maybe I was raised the wrong way. But the point being is that in the movie, they dealt with the loss of a loved one. And they dealt with the commitment of being a real father. Well, I would ask, wouldn't we be better off if we dealt with the full aspect of life? You know, Jesus said he came to give us life and life more abundantly. And part of that abundant life is suffering. It is part of our normal life existence. All the emotions that we have were created by God. Depression is not something evil. Depression is a part of the reality of the human experience. God created it for a reason. When you are depressed, you seek to be relieved or you seek that which brings you to the place of intimacy with God, a tenderness, a willingness to receive comfort. Because a depressed person, really, they're kind of spiraling down a little bit, but they can come out of it. You know, me personally, I always enjoyed a good depression because it always brought me a good expression of how I felt and I was able to take that to God and give him my depression in a way that was like either through poetry or song or just this real life feelings that, you know, suddenly instead of being lukewarm, oh, it was real about my depression, you know, nearly killed me because I nearly killed myself, you know, and that's how real my depressions got sometimes. And so, in that, I could take it to God with all passion and flame, so to speak, and God would hear. And it was almost as though that broke through a barrier, you know, in my life at that point in time. And so sometimes suffering does that. It breaks down walls. 
it reduces your humanity to a bottom denominator that you can finally get through your flesh to let your spirit free to set your spirit free that it might worship thee that it might go to God and find the comfort and the comforter who alone can make you feel that with which God knows you need at that moment now Jesus exemplifies suffering in the the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, where he agonized in prayer, you know, over what was going to happen to him. And some people say that the battle was won or lost there in the garden, and some people say that all of his pain and agony was experienced right there in the garden, and I tend to agree. Because for me, I've always mourned someone that was about to die before they ever died. I always somehow prepared myself beforehand for whatever loss or pain or thing I was going through, somehow I always experienced it before then, a taste of it anyways, so that by the time I was going through it, I really used it as a bridge for someone else. You know, like I remember laying in a hospital bed, and uh, I think the guy's name was Greg Castleberry, you know, and, uh, hey, Greg, wherever you are. <laughs> he was going through surgeries that I was going through, and uh, he had ulcerated colitis, and I had Crohn's disease. And we were having similar surgeries, but pretty much the same surgery, and fast produced. But um, when we came out, you know, we were miserably suffering because, you know, it's like you're, you got your guts cut up, you know, and you're, you're holding your guts inside, so to speak, because you're stapled, you know. And, and you just kind of like, you know, you can't laugh, you can't breathe, you can't move because you got a tube in your nose, you know, and you're just kind of like suffering unbelievably. So I looked over at him and I said, you're ugly. And we started cracking up. And I was like, you don't want to make each other crack up. But then what's funny is that because you have someone to crack up with, you start cracking up. So then it just got funnier and funnier, you know. Or like when you were trying, we were trying to get nurses' attention, you know, and we'd say something like, uh, nurse, nurse, need a urinal, you know, not, <laughs> watch out, we're going to find a, a trash basket or something. You know, I said, yeah, I could just imagine you trying to roll over for a trash basket. And it was funny. I mean, at the time, it was kind of gross humor, but crass humor. But when you have someone that shares in your sorrow, you can laugh about it. And it hurts. Believe me, that little bit of laughter hurt like a son of a gun. But the little bit of joy also brought comfort. And that's what God wants to do to you in your suffering. You see, he wants to bring you a little bit of comfort in ways you never thought of. Like maybe through a companion that's there in your hospital room or even a dying companion that you may be experiencing death with or as we know that there's hospices a counselor or comforter that's there to help you and to share with you if they really understand where you are at but Jesus wants to be that person that you may not have understood who he is completely as the Son of God and you may not comprehend that being the Son of Man he is familiar with what you're going through. But he wants you to know that he is the man acquainted with sorrows. The man of sorrows. And there's a lot more sorrows that he felt than we ever could imagine. So when you think that you don't know that anyone else can hear you or you don't have anyone visiting you like I did, you know, I mean, sure, you know, there was always these, you know, supposed prayer lists or supposed people putting me on some kind of prayer ministry thing, you know, whatever, you know. But nobody came. You know, and nobody visited, and nobody was there, and I didn't have a, you know, any feelings about it one way or the other because I really thought, why would they come? You know, <laughs> you know, yeah, I knew the Keith Green songs, but the truth is, is the way I looked, you know, I was like, man, I was like 80, 80 pounds, you know, I mean, I looked like zombies, <laughs> you know, flesh hanging off my bones, you know, no meat, no fat, you know, it looked like, you know, my legs looked like my fingers, you know, I mean, things like that, and I was like. Why would anybody want to see me like that? You know, I didn't want to see me like that, so I sure didn't want other people to. But, you know, looking back, I know that they, they should have. And maybe they would have if they could have, but God wanted me to learn what it's like to be alone in suffering. Perfect through sufferings. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Carry you here and watch. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, 
If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Being in agony. You see, he wasn't agonizing first, but he was already in agony because he could already feel the experience because he could not just project a magic, but he knew what was coming. He knew that all hell was about to break loose on him. And he knew that that very aspect that you're going through, the suffering, literally, or that last door that you walked through, death, couldn't stop you from going through it. You have to go through it yourself. You will be alone. And when you do and close your eyes and you're released from your flesh, you will go on to be present with the Lord. Because to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. Because God gave us a promise that He Himself, knowing what it was like for His Father to turn His back on Him, and then to leave the presence of His body behind, and to be put into the bowels of the earth, Sheol, the grave, and to preach liberty to the captives over there. He knows what that terror is like, though he felt none. He knows what that sheer abhorrence of having any comfort from a personal relationship with God is like when that separation comes for however long it lasted. But when that restoration of that happens, that's why Jesus is there. When you die, if that's what your suffering is right now, Jesus is there. You know, people say they see a great life. People say they've been to heaven. People say they've been to hell. People say they've been everywhere. Maybe that will prepare you. Maybe that's what you need to hear. But the best things I know of is that Jesus himself will be where you are. That to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I do believe that you don't have to walk through a tunnel. I do believe you don't have to float out from your body. I do believe that you can be instantaneously from the moment you die to the moment you're with the Lord. I don't believe in this nether world of in-betweens because I don't find it in Scripture. I don't see it as a reality in what God has said. And I don't believe with my heart based upon my experiences with a lot of things. <laughs> we won't go into all the sufferings and all this death stuff. But based upon my experiences, it's like, yes, some people need to have these experiences they've had. And according to their faith, it is so. And according to their conscience, God makes it so. So I don't have a problem with them for them. I would only have a problem if they say, based on their experience, they tell it it's for all of us, and I can't say that. I don't believe in people coming back from heaven or back from hell and then telling me something that I need to do. I got what I need to do. It's called the Word of God. I do believe that that person has experienced whatever they experienced based upon their experience with their relationship with God for a reason and a purpose that them and God has. But I don't believe that it's for my benefit necessarily. It may be interesting to me and it may be fascinating and I may look at it and go, well that's interesting. Now. And some of it may line up with scripture at times. But sometimes things just don't quite jive and I just go, well, it still could have happened for them. But the way they perceived it based upon what God was doing Maybe for a reason I can't see and I don't know. So I won't quantify it or qualify it. I'll just say according to their faith it was so. And so for me, based upon the scriptures and based upon what I've seen in my life with people dying around me and dealing with death and dealing with my own personal involvement in suffering and death, I would say that God, being that he was acquainted with sorrows, his soul being exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death, he likewise experienced that near-death experience right up until the moment that he even agonized even more because he knew, like, God, you know, what is it? And it wasn't doubt about his mission. That's not the point in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not doubt about whether or not he was doing it. He was just saying, is there any other way? You know, because we're, we're making the entire world now required to come to me. We're making everything based upon one aspect. So that means all this sin is going to come upon me. I am going to be made sin for the salvation of the world. Is there any other way, God? Is there any other way?
other way. God said, so when you want sometimes to be freed up from your pain and suffering, sometimes there is a way. Sometimes you will be spared. But I will tell you this, sometimes there is no other way but to go through it. And if you do, then you are likened unto the Son of Man who, because God said no, you were able to go through it. There's a false teaching out that people say something about, God will never give you anything bigger than you can handle. Yeah, he will. Oh, most definitely. He'll go through you, the experience with you, though you may not know he's there, and you may not know afterwards he's there. You may know it down the road that he was there, but you may not know him because there are things that God does allow into our life that are consequence that it will be bigger than you are, and it will literally tear you to shreds. I know, I've been there. And then once you are restored, because he'll pick up the pieces, kind of like this Eric Nelson song, one time it was said, I'm looking up the pieces once again. And it was such a tender, merciful, caring song about how the pieces of his life had been shredded and torn and cast to the wind. And then God picked them up one by one and put them together again into a complete man. Just something that comforted me, you know, because some of the songs that we get, they're nice platitudes, but they don't have that feeling that the person's been there. The sorrows of death compass me, and the pains of hell got hold of me. When somebody tells me that, and as only Jesus could have, I know he's been there. I know he feels what I feel, he hurts what I hurt. I would never have had the personal intimacy with God had I not been away from that wonderful church experience that some people get, you know, where they have, oh, thousands of people came and visited me while I was in the hospital, and we all prayed, and, you know, got together, and, you know, sang songs, and rejoiced, and, you know, I got out of the hospital, and everything was fine. I had no comforter. I had no brother that visited me. I had no sister, no mother, no father, no person with my comfort. But then, at times, God was there. And when he was, it was like, and I remember one time I was in the Long Beach VA hospital, uh, Balboa Native, Long Beach VA hospital, and I was going down to a Christian concert because the only Christians I could ever get a hold of, really, were the ones that came down to Long Beach VA hospital to do little concerts, you know, at times for the VA patients in the auditorium. And Bob Bennett came. <laughs> and it was just balling time. I was hurting and I was in sorrow and felt like God had just owned me and the church didn't want to have me. And, you know, you feel all these things, you know, because you're going through all the emotional turmoils that your flesh is from all the drugs they're trying on you. And a lot of it doesn't have to do with the reality of where you're at. It just has to do with the drugs they're putting through you. <laughs> and uh, I just remember him being there, you know, and being up on that little stage, you know, and sharing. And I thought, Wow, that is so cool when a man of God will go even to the least of these, you know, and minister. And kind of like I learned later that um, some musicians told me in different settings, you know, it's like some people just do it because it's supposed to be done or it should be done, but some people really care. And, you know, you felt like you could tell the difference when you're there, if they really care about you or if they're just singing the song to do their thing. Because some people shouldn't be in certain areas of ministry. And that's the truth. But some people, they have a gift. And Bob Bennett was one of them at the time. And he may be still, but there in that little tiny setting, I know everyone that was there felt God's love, God's touch. Not just from Bob Bennett, but from the Holy Spirit himself. And so I was ministered to. It was very good because the next day I nearly died. I understand when Jesus says the sorrows of hell got hold of me. And when you've been there, you'll know. And it will change your perspective on people. It'll rearrange your ideas about you know, wanting to kill off everyone in the world. You know, it kind of changes your priorities you know, about what you think is important. Because when you have suffered, 
then you'll want to help others who are suffering. I found trouble and sorrow. Reproach had broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, and there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. I looked on my right hand, behold, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me, no man cared for my soul. There's a psalm that says, O oh my soul, why art thou disquieted with them? Why art thou fearful and disquieted with them? Fear not, for I shall yet praise him. That's not how it goes. <laughs> How's it go? Let me think. I almost want to say it says, Soul? Why aren't thou disquieted? Anyways, it talks about a. If you're wondering why I can't remember, it's because right now I'm in a lot of pain. <laughs> Man, am I in pain. It's like, it's really hard to get through the, the fog because when you experience severe pain, you learn that you can ignore pain, you can distract pain, you can choose to work through pain. But it's almost like at some point in time, if you're a writer, you know, you realize and you recognize it, it's kind of like a fog. It's kind of like it's, you have to work through the fog of it, you know, because it influences you, but it doesn't stop you from doing what you want to do, because if you have a spirit, your spirit can overcome your flesh. I mean, that's just a fact of life by way of the Holy Spirit. But for those who get into this, you know, you got to be healed thing. It's like, oh, give me a break. Go away. You know, it's like you just want to go, yeah, I don't even have it time to explain to you the scriptures, you know, it's like, just go away, you know, come back when you've suffered a little bit, and then we'll talk, you know, I'll explain to you about it, but you know, I mean, there's some people that do, their theology is such that they couldn't have a hangnail, except they think that sin's involved, you know, so, God bless them, but don't have time, you know, there are a lot of people suffering in this world, and uh, so, in my memory, sometimes it does get a little fuzzy when I get into this phase where I'm kind of like, Half of my my spirit, so to speak, is warring against this pain. No, well, half of my my uh, calories, so to speak, is used up in just kind of like dealing with pain. And then I get what's usually called deficientation, where the thinking process gets a little kind of fuzzy. You kind of go, man, you know, it's kind of hard to think and 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 suffer too. <laughs> it's like, man, can we just like put the pain aside for a while? You know, it's like. Uh-uh. <laughs> God ain't going to do it. You're going to get it, and you're going to go through it. And, you know, it's good to suffer, you know, because once you have suffered, then once you pass through it, you are acquainted with grief. You are acquainted with sorrow. Even as the man of sorrows, Jesus himself was our example, that he too likewise experienced. He is despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. I think the reality of where we think we elevate pastors and teachers or great men of God and that we somehow set aside people that are suffering, you know, in some ways that we put them into hospitals or far away, we kind of move backwards from what God wants us to do. I think that the greater should be that we are there with the person suffering, you know, agonizing with them or enduring with them that maybe we put hospital rooms together for such a reason, you know, and to go and do that thing. But, you know, it used to be that people suffered at home. They were dealing with it in the household. It was part of the family experience. They knew how to be a part of each other's life. They even had, as it were, in New England houses, what's called the death room, you know, where the people went in that room to die. It was part of their house, believe it or not. And it's kind of interesting, you know, that way, that, you know, we now call it home health care, you know, people with hospice training or whatever make money, but, you know, some of them, but, you know, there's a bringing back of that idea that, you know, you're a little healthier when you're at home, when you're around family, you know, that familiar settings, you know, that makes it better for you, and I think that really the church ought to be a part of that in a better way, because we who have suffered 
would have enjoyed not just watching it on, you know, now we can do that on a video screen, you know, in a hospital room, but wouldn't it have been nice, you know, if somehow we got people to come to the sanctuary, to come to the worship service, to come to the place where everybody's already at? If I remember right, and I could be wrong, but it seems like one time, one Calvary, I don't know where, I can't remember if it was Costa Mesa or not, but it seems like there was one time where one person in a hospital bed actually got wheeled in. you know. And I just thought that was the greatest thing in the world. They were wheeled into a hospital. It might even have been at the, I'm not sure, it might have been at the, the, uh, uh, Orange County Convention Center when they first introduced Psalms Alive, you know, to the entire Calvary community, to the entire world, basically, and released the album. That might have been when it happened, too. I'm not sure. I can't remember. I know we've always been kind of, like, proactive for handicapped and all that stuff, but the point being is that when you're suffering, you know, sometimes, believe it or not, having someone else that laughs with you and cares with you and isn't just there miserable, you know, sitting in a hospital bed going, oh, you poor thing, let me pray for you. You know, it's like, then you got to entertain them. But, you know, when you make it funny, you know, when you enjoy it, kind of like they do in VA hospitals, you know, you got a bunch of, I'm not trying to slam anybody's ethnic origins, but you know what? Them housekeepers, because most of them were all black. Them black housekeepers come by, you know, and they were cleaning the bed, they go, honey, you need to get out of that bed, you know, because you stink, you need a bath, you need to get cleaned up, you know, we're going to tell that nurse to come down here and just scrub your butt, you know, because you stink. And you just start cracking up and you laugh and carry on. And, you know, they were the Holy Spirit for us. You know, they were funny. And if I could give you a word, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So if you would enjoy visiting someone and bring joy to them, then I would tell you that's so much better than bringing, you know, your, your, your nice comfort is nice, you know, but the person in bed is probably trying to entertain you more than you are doing for them when you're trying to minister to them. You're really better off kind of like just getting some humor or getting something that they can connect with going. Because otherwise, misery loves company, but you know what? That just dreams drags you both down. But laughter is medicine for the soul. And if I could give you a word today for those that are suffering, you know, even as I am, <laughs> I get a kick out of it for you. <laughs> I just think it's funny. It's like, oh man. Darn, I wanted to do so much more and I'm suffering today, so I'm not going to do that much more. And it's not, and this is where people don't get it, it's not a bad day. You see, just because I'm suffering doesn't make it a bad day. What I do with it is what makes it a good day or a bad day, but this is the day the Lord has made. So, I don't know about you, if you're suffering, I don't know what you're doing. And if you're dying, I don't know what you're doing, but you know, this is the day the Lord has made, so you should rejoice and be glad in for whatever day the Lord has made, we should be glad. And that's the point of why we are Christians. They'll know we are Christians by the way we deal with suffering, death, misery, depression, loss of a loved one, loss of a life. Those are the things that reveal who we are, not the time for we're dancing on the streets, you know, and shouting to the heavens, you know, and declaring, you know, Jesus is coming again. Heck, any religious fanatic can do that. And most of them do that. What makes us different that the world wants to see is how we deal with those things they're terrified of that we shouldn't be. So today, if I could encourage you, recognize Jesus not just always as your comforter and your healer and your salvation and your redeemer and your friend and all that stuff. But remember, he's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. A man of sorrows. That is my Jesus. <laughs>